Welcome friends on this second Sunday in Advent. We are so grateful that you could join us this day for worship, for a collaborative worship service, a pre-recorded worship service uh, that by math, uh, by my math at least, approximately 28 different people from as far away as, as Elaine Foy in Oregon uh, helped uh, or pitched in to help put this service together. So thanks be to God for the many hands that helped put this worship service together. A few brief announcements uh, this day before we get going. Number one, our blessing box is being used a lot, which is great, um, but it's a little bit sparse at the moment. Uh, so if any of you have uh, extra canned goods, non-perishable food items, toiletry items, things of that nature, um, we would invite you to drop them by and put them in our blessing box uh, anytime at your convenience since it's outside of our main entrance. Number two, as you can see today, uh, this is uh, a communion Sunday as this is the first Sunday in the month. So if you have not done so already, we invite you to get some bread, um, some crackers, some sort of juice or something of that nature if you would like to celebrate communion with us uh, later on uh, in the hour. And number three, just a few uh, quick pastoral care concerns. Number one, we, uh, we continue to pray uh, for the family and friends of Francis Reynolds, who died very unexpectedly at the age of 81. A few weeks ago, I was, uh, I was privileged to preside at a very small private service uh, for her and her immediate family in Nicholasville earlier this week. Uh, and then laid her remains to rest at Maple Grove Cemetery uh, again in Nicholasville. So we pray for Frances Reynolds uh, and, and for her uh, family and friends. We also continue to pray for the family and friends of longtime BPC member Lonnie Hodges, who died a few weeks ago. So we pray for you, Sarah, and for all of your friends and family. Uh, we acknowledge that losing someone, uh, a beloved uh, pr a person, a spouse or otherwise is always difficult, but especially around the holidays and also during a pandemic. So Sarah, we are continuing to hold you in our prayers. And we also continue to hold our prayers, Danny and Melody Kazee and their family, as they continue to mourn the tragic loss of their 10-year-old uh, grandson, Lucas. Uh, and finally, as far as, um, as far as deaths go, we also pray for uh, Beth Alexander and her family, Beth's uh, Aunt Tilly died yesterday. So Beth, we're holding you all in our prayers. Uh, please be praying for Meg Bowden. Uh, Meg had a, a second procedure to, uh, to drain some fluid from a benign cyst. Uh, so, but I've heard uh, that everything went well. So Meg, uh, stay well, keep well, and uh, please hold uh, everyone, hold her in your prayers. And continued prayers for Thanksgiving, even as Danny and Melody um, navigate the waters of losing their grandson, they had the good news a few weeks ago of getting a new kidney <clears throat> for Danny, uh, a gift that uh, Danny had waited, I think, about two and a half years for. I chatted with Danny and Melody a few days ago, and Danny's doing great. His body has accepted the kidney with flying colors, and uh, they got to return the home dialysis machine, which I'm sure was a very happy occasion for them. So uh, as they um, endure this kind of emotional whiplash of grief and joy, please hold uh, them in your prayers. All right, friends, before we worship, uh, as, we, as we tend to do, let's breathe together, uh, and then we will have um, our poetry prayer and our prelude, and, and we'll get on with worship. Friends, let's breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. Breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. And finally, let us breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. Friends, let us worship God. My dad built me a changing table. For nine months, my mom watched her ankles swell and her belly grow. For nine months, my dad would come home from work, kiss her on the forehead, pressing bangs to skin, and tell her she was beautiful. Then for nine months, he'd slip into the garage to build a sawdust sandcastles and a dresser out of dreams. I imagine she smiled, perched in that rocking chair, 
He was in his wood shop, preparing the way. 18 years later, I left for college. As I packed my bags, my mom ba baked blueberry muff muffins for the road. Smell of home. She wrapped them in foil and placed them in a cardboard box, willing similar layers of protection to be wrapped around me, her little girl. She was preparing the way. My aunts and uncles bought sweatshirts in my new school colors. My dad taught me how to change a tire. My mom gave me the earrings I'd been <laughs> sneaking out of her jewelry box for the last four years. I had sticky notes, sticky note love letters on the kitchen door for them to find when they returned home. When we, we were quiet in the car, my brother cried. We were all preparing the way. And through these moments, I have come to see that preparation and love can be the same thing. For there is something about love that makes us want to prepare. There's something about love that compels us to throw open the doors, yell it from the rooftop, set the table, decorate the nursery, leave love notes on the back door, build the changing table, trim the tree, bake muffins for the road, and when it's time, if you must, let go. Preparation and love can be the same thing. John the Baptist said, prepare the way. So family of faith, how do we prepare our minds for worship? We silence the inner circle. We let go of our busy thoughts. We make space for God to speak. How do we prepare our hearts for worship? We bless all emotions. We feel what we feel. We open ourselves up to be moved. How do we prepare our bodies for worship? We take in the scent, sight, and feel of this space. We breathe in God's mercy. We exhale God's love. How do we prepare our souls for worship? We bring our full selves into this space. We wear our hearts on our sleeves. We trust that even now, God is here. Family of faith, what we practice in worship, we must live out in our daily lives. So prepare the way. Let us worship Holy God.
I dream of the first pitch of opening season. I dream of a laundry day where each sock finds its mate. I dream of family home for the holidays. I dream of good books and homemade meals. I dream of sunset drives with the windows down. These are beautiful dreams, but I also have urgent dreams. I dream of conversations across party lines. I dream of more bridges and less walls. I dream of more laughter and less fear. I dream of more listening and less tears. But most of all, I dream of peace like a river. Today, we light the candle of peace. May it remind us that there is another way. Amen. not want anyone to perish, but rather for all to come to repentance. Therefore, let us confess our sins, for God's salvation is at hand. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, we wish that peace was something we could buy. We wish that peace could be ordered in a subscription service, found on a map, downloaded in an app, or voted for in a ballot. We wish that peace was as easy as a one-time choice when we are feeling our best, However, what we have found is that peace involves everyday decisions over and over, whether or not we are feeling our best. So today we confess in front of this community of faith that we need your help in this Advent season. Prepare the way for greater peace and teach us how to be a part of it. Amen. Christ. By the mercy of Christ, our sins are forgiven, for salvation is at hand for those who turn to God. join me in the prayer for illumination. God of peace, we must admit there are a million things on our minds. We would like to be as focused as John the Baptist, preparing the way, gathering the crowd, spreading the word of your arrival. Maybe then we'd know peace. However, more often than not, we are a swirling compilation of grocery lists, text messages, emails, and over-referenced to-do lists. So today we ask for your help in preparing the way. Could you start with our ears and then maybe move to our hearts? We'd like to hear you more clearly. Maybe then we'll know peace. Gratefully we pray. Amen. Our first scripture is from Psalm 85, verses 1 and 2 and 8 through 13. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. 
You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Selah. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. The second scripture is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for the God. Every valley should be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get ye up to a mountain, high mountain. O Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. scripture mark 1 through 8 the beginning of the good news of jesus christ the son of god as it is written in the prophet isaiah see i am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare you in in your way the voice of one crying out in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make his path straight john the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and people from the whole Judean 
Judean countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and the leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am nor worthy to stoop down and unite the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with holy water, but he has baptized you with the Holy Spirit. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. There's so much sorrow here, so much shame and hurt and fear. And this grief feels like the ache is never ending. The night is long, can't find sleep Where's peace gone? It's so hard to breathe It's time to dream fierce dreams Like Mary did Brave dreams Like Joseph did New dreams You've heard me preach a lot this year on the topics of social justice. You've heard me preach a lot on the topics of income inequality, access to affordable health care, and systemic racism. I've brought up on numerous occasions from the pulpit our country's obsession with military spending, and yes, I've spent no small amount of time criticizing the outgoing presidential administration uh, for their oppressive and violent policies. But today's sermon isn't going to focus on any of that. 
as us preachers stand in the pulpit week in and week out, whether a physical one or a virtual one, we must balance the prophetic with the pastoral. And so I've decided not to preach on the gospel passage uh, today. Uh, John the Baptist, with his wild hair, fiery preaching voice, uh, and penchant for eating bugs, uh, just doesn't sound very comforting to me this week. Uh, therefore, we're going to turn to the Isaiah passage that Doug and Mary McLaren read for us just a few minutes ago. Isaiah is a really big book of the Bible, and it's by far the most robust of the Old Testament prophets. And because it's such a big book and it covers so much territory, it's helpful to step back and remind ourselves of the bigger picture of its message and how it's structured. Although your Bible at home probably shows Isaiah as being just one book of the Bible, most biblical scholars consider it to be three books, or they divide it up into three sections um, that are in the following portions. The first book of Isaiah is chapters 1 through 39, and it deals with the events leading up to the Babylonian exile, which happened when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroyed Jerusalem in 587 BCE, destroying the political independence of the southern kingdom of Judah, and most importantly and, and most devastatingly, taking the Israelites as captives back to Babylon. The second book of Isaiah is chapters 40 through 55 and is sometimes referred to as the book of consolation. It chronicles God speaking through the prophet uh, Isaiah to God's people, comforting them in their lament and promising them that their days of anguish are numbered. And finally, the third book of Isaiah is chapters 55 through 66 and deals with the Israelites' return from the exile. So today's passage comes at the very beginning of the second book of Isaiah. The exile has begun. The Israelites have been taken from Jerusalem and forced into slavery in a foreign land. And this brought with it many theological questions, but the prime one was this. Is our God legit? You see, back in those days, when one army defeated another, it was assumed that that meant that the God of the victor was obviously stronger than the God of the loser. So when the Israelites were defeated and taken into captivity by the Babylonians, it caused a severe theological crisis. They wondered, was Yahweh really the one? All those stories that we've been told and shared about Yahweh, were they true or were they all just fake news? In the midst of the Israelites' physical, emotional, and spiritual anguish, the prophet Isaiah speaks into the space of their lament, saying these words. Here again, the words of Scripture. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Comfort, comfort, says the prophet, into a space of grieving, isolation, and pain. Comfort, comfort, says God to God's people who have had their worlds upended and their lives torn apart. Comfort, comfort, says today's text to us, who have endured so much this year. Now I know it's natural uh, that this time of year, we all get a little retrospective, spending the time processing the year that's been and we look forward to the year that's soon to be. Now as the saying goes, the grass is always greener on the other side and it's not uncommon these days to adopt a posture of relief that any particular year is over. Um, but obviously this year has been uh, challenging uh, so much. We've walked together, you and I, through so much this year as a congregation. Our Lenten season was disrupted early with the arrival of COVID-19. And as of today, Sunday, December 6th, it's been 273 days 
since we've been able to gather together and worship together physically in the sanctuary. 273 days since we've been able to hug one another, shake hands and greet one another without masks on. 273 days since we've been able to sing hymns together like we, like we used to. Now, if you're anything like me, the past 273 days have tested your resilience. I, for one, was actually rather proud of myself for how I dealt with the first few months of the pandemic. Uh, I was in a get or done mode uh, between helping uh, this congregation navigate uh, to new ways of being in community with one another uh, to the final preparations before my daughter's birth. I was pretty busy and hopeful and even some days somewhat excited for the new challenge as a pastor, as a husband, and as a soon-to-be father. But that was the adrenaline talking. Um, one day turned into a week, turned into a month, turned into a few months, <laughs> and now here we are, 273 days later, exhausted, grieving, agonizing, longing, questioning how much longer we can endure this wilderness. What some of us foolishly hoped would be a quick sprint has ended up being a seemingly relentless and never-ending marathon. Now this, of course, isn't to say that we didn't always have our challenges before the pandemic, but at least then we could gather physically to encourage, uplift, and support one another. Um, we've, we were very blessed to have the technology that allows us to do this uh, in other ways of gathering, but try though as we might to convey compassion, sympathy, and love through the phone or over Zoom meetings or from the camera lens to your screen wherever you're watching this, there are just limitations to the amount of intimacy that technology can offer. So if you're anything like me, we're just crying out for something to change. We just need something, someone, anything, to upset our new normal and bring some sort of relief. That too was the feeling of the Israelites when they found themselves in their particular brand of exile. And so the prophet continues with these words. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These words comfort me these days because it reminds me that even though it may not always look like it, that God has the ability to interrupt places of stagnancy, that God's glory can and will be revealed for all of us to see despite the rough edges of our lives or the valleys in which we find ourselves. Today's text speaks words of comfort to those of us who are navigating valleys of all kinds. Valleys of experiencing the holidays for the first time since the death of your parent, your brother or sister, your child, or even your grandchild. Valleys of spending the holidays alone for the first time in your life. Valleys of living by yourself these days and not having the human contact that you were used to before the pandemic. Valleys of being utterly exhausted by the never ending responsibilities of being a parent uh, during a pandemic. Valleys of living with mental illness and finding the struggle to maintain self care uh, even harder than it was before the pandemic and valleys of witnessing the deaths of those you love and not being able to attend their funeral, if even there is one, because it's just not safe. The valleys are plentiful, but so are the ways that God can make the rough places a plain. Together we cry out to God to smooth things over and to give us some sort of reprieve from the monotony of yet another day in quarantine. In today's passage, the prophet dares to speak these comforting words to a people who are in the midst of an exile. And here we are today in a very different kind of exile, receiving those same promises. 
And the promises continue in today's passage by reminding us of the preciousness and fragility of our human experience in the larger context of God's eternal sovereignty. A voice says, cry out, and what? And I said, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. We are like the grass, this passage says, that withers and fades. Now those words may not seem like words of comfort, but there's truth and wisdom in them nevertheless. Part of appreciating, appreciating the preciousness of our lives is understanding the finite length of our lives on earth. And for some of us, especially those in our congregation who are older, might feel a particular lament that this pandemic has kept them from their loved ones during what might be their final years on this earth. But the truth is, regardless of our age, none of us is promised tomorrow, and that our job is to live today as faithfully as we can. And amidst the struggles of today, we are reminded that though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of God will stand forever. And then today's passage closes with these uplifting words. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good things. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. Though the people this passage was originally written for are in the deepest of valleys, the prophet nonetheless tells them and us to get you up to a high mountain and lift up your voice with strength. Now, I realize that can seem like a tall order these days, but these words are spoken by someone who is sure of the capacity of God's redemption. Hear these words. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. So friends, when I hear these promises of scripture, I, like you, dream of the day when we can worship together physically. I dream of the day when we can sing hymns together with Lydia behind the organ and share communion together in person in the sanctuary and physically hold one another in moments of both joy and grief. I dream of the day when you can hold your grandchild again. I dream of the day when I can pass my six-month-old daughter around a room of strangers so that they can ooh and awe at her and not have to worry about anything. I dream of the day when I can write sermons like these in Starbucks again. I dream of days when I'm guaranteed access to the hospital when one of you are sick. I dream of so many things, and today's passage tells me to prepare even as I dream, to make way for a new day, a day when we will be rid of the exile we find ourselves in, a day when we'll finally be able to throw away those darn masks and hold one another and sing God's praises together. It may seem like a dream, because right now that is what it is. But together, let us keep dreaming of that day and prepare for it, even if we're not quite sure exactly when it will be. But how do we prepare as we dream this day? Well, for today, let's prepare the way by joining together at the Lord's table. We come to this table to receive the daily manna, the daily manna, that we need to do the next right thing that God's calling us to do. We come to this table to proclaim the truth of Isaiah 40, that our hope is rooted in none other than the God who has promised to be our shepherd and to hold us in her bosom. Commentator Glenn Bell describes today's passage as the following. Isaiah 40 is like a cool drink on a sweltering day, a lover's embrace after a long separation, a powerful promise that transforms our perspective. So come to the table 
to have your perspective transformed. No, the grace we find at the Lord's table does not promise to make things easy. The grace we find at the Lord's table does not fix everything or even promise immediate relief. But the grace we find at the Lord's table is nothing more or less than the resurrection we, uh, the resurrection hope we have in Jesus Christ, a stubborn hope that holds within it the power to lift up every valley and flatten every mountain. A resurrection hope that promises that we, the sheep of God's fold, now scattered and isolated, will be gathered once more and held in the warm embrace of the God who is our eternal parent. So my dear friends and fellow dreamers, do not lose heart. Hold fast to the truth that peace is coming as we anticipate the birth of Emmanuel, God with us, peace among us, peace within us, and peace around us. Come to the table to taste the peace that passes all understanding. Come to the table to dream of an uninhibited highway for our God, one where we may move again like we used to, hug again like we used to, and sing again like we used to. Comfort, comfort you, my people. Comfort, comfort you who are dreaming of better days. Comfort, comfort. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, May all of us, God's people, say, Amen. of faith. We believe that a voice cried out in the wilderness, saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. And so we sew up for worship, even from home. We march toward justice. We roll up our sleeves. We plant trees for our children. We make art. We choose hope. We gather at the table. We set an extra plate. We sing loudly with joy. We share stories of wisdom. We celebrate children, we fall together, we, we rise together, we love together. We do all these things because we believe that God loves us so much that God shows up here. So we prepare and prepare for that next beautiful day. May it be, may it be so, amen. So come with gratitude and come with joy to the table of the Lord. Bring the works of your hands and the gift of your lives as an offering of praise. At this time, let us give of our tithes and our offerings.
Let's pray together. We give you thanks and praise, O God, that you have built us up in faith and bound us together in love. By your grace, may all that we do show the glory of your name and serve the good of your people through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Friends, welcome to this table. This is not my table. It is not a Presbyterian table. It is the Lord's table. And it is the place for those who dream. So wherever you are, know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, this table extends from this beautiful sanctuary into your homes or wherever you are participating in this service. And know that you are welcome uh, to participate and celebrate with us using whatever elements you have at your disposal. I would invite you to uh, join me in the prayer of great thanksgiving that you will find uh, printed in your bulletin. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Holy God, great dreamer, how wondrous are your deeds. You created the world and all that is in it. With a mighty arm, you parted the waters and led your people to liberation. And when we were in exile, you gathered us up in your bosom and led us home like a mother sheep. When we were mistreating our own, you sent prophets to set us right. You pulled down the arrogant and lifted up the weak. And when the time was right, you sent Jesus to set us free. Now send us again your life-giving spirit and recharge your promise within us, for we are eagerly awaiting our Savior to come again from heaven. gratitude and with expectation, we remember that Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. And so also we remember that Jesus took the cup saying, this is the new covenant of love and grace poured out for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, as we wait for him to come again, O God, stir up your power and restore us by sending your Holy Spirit to infuse us with hope in the great mystery of faith. Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.
So friends, come to the table. There is nothing you need to do or not do, nothing indeed that you can do or not do that would prevent you from being welcomed to this table. So as we live through these difficult and uncertain days, let us dream together for a new world. Let us dream for the time when God will, uh, will rescue us from this exile and bring us back together again. And today I hope that what you find at the table is the grace that you need to get through this day to do the next right thing and to live as faithfully as you can. So friends, come for the table is set. I now invite you to partake of the elements with me. Friends, this is the bread of life. And this is the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this meal. Even as we are separated in our homes right now, bring us together with the power of your Holy Spirit to send us from this place that we may dream your dream into reality. In the name of your beloved child, whose resurrection we proclaim through this meal, we pray. Amen. Friends, our final hymn this day is hymn number 378, We Wait the Peaceful Kingdom. The cross, we will take it. The bread, we will break it. The pain, we will bear it. The joy, we will share it. The gospel, we will live it. The love, we will give it. The light, 
We will cherish it. The darkness. God shall perish it.